so broadly speaking, while deductive reasoning is from the general to the particular, inductive reasoning is from the particular to the general. And so, um, this is the example. Uh, in, inductive logic begins with any number of particulars and makes a generalization about them. And so we find a truth in Romans. We find a truth in Timothy. We find a truth in Galatians. We find a truth in... And we start putting these particulars together and we're observing a trend. Okay? We're finding that because the Bible is coherent, because the Bible agrees with itself and God never lies, so we start putting these elements together. And we find, um, as we have a comprehensive inductive process, when we include the maximum amount of data possible, we don't have an absolute certainty, but we can have an effective certainty. Okay? Uh, that's a different term. Guys, has a different term for it. I'll find it here in a moment. Um, because the Bible is a finite book with infinite truth, right? <laughs> There's 66 books, there's 1,189 chapters, there's 33,410 verses. All right, there's a certain number of words, and it's finite. It is conceivable that you can exhaustively study everything there is to bear on a given subject, and you should. Okay, don't build a doctrine of marriage on one chapter. And you know, we hit it from 1 Corinthians 7 when we were teaching 1 Corinthians as, as a book series. And so we get to chapter 7, and there's the topic of marriage, there's the topic of divorce. But it's not the only place in the Bible that, that addresses marriage. And so if, if you're going to teach a, a doctrine of marriage and you're going to limit it to just one chapter, you're not teaching a doctrine of marriage. You're teaching what one chapter says about marriage. Okay? And you need to add to that what all the Word of God says on a particular subject. How would my doctrine of marriage be if I built it on the book of Judges? And, I, and then the only book of the Bible I take for the doctrine of marriage is the book of Judges. And then I would start prescribing some pretty unique ways to go obtain a wife for yourself, including abducting a, you know, these women in, in a <laughs> when they were trying to save the tribe of Benjamin. Okay? Is, that, is that normative? Is that how we all should find wives? No. Okay. We, 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 need to, we need to know what's normative, what's, what's unusual, what... We've got, to, we've got to put all the passages of Scripture together. What applies to Israel? What applies to the church? Let's rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? On an inductive basis. So, I, I do highlight this. There is, of course, such a thing as perfect induction where every particular instance has been examined. So, one can be certain about the conclusion in such a case when you know there's only a finite amount of data sets, then you can examine them all and inductively you can conclude appropriately. Uh, every coin in my pocket is a penny. Well, that can be demonstrated. You can, you can examine every coin in my pocket and I uh, know this for, for sure. My pocket is limited space. Every coin can be scrutinized. Likewise, the Bible contains a limited amount of information. It seems overwhelming. It seems a lot. But it is finite. It has a beginning. It has an end. It's got 66 books. We can search all of Scripture. And we're supposed to. Search the Scriptures diligently. See if these things are so. Hence, one can have a kind of certainty about what it teaches if every verse has been probed carefully. But see, here's the thing. You and I have to be fair with the text. And you and I have to be, if we've constructed a doctrine, as we're going to do coming up in angelology related to Satan and the fallen angels and the angelic conflict, we've got a lot of things to look at with the thorn in the flesh passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we have to recognize that any inductive study we put together has room for improvement if we have neglected a, a, a passage. If we've neglected to ascertain certain data. Okay? Now we may look at a passage and say, you know what, I understand what's happening there in Judges, I understand that's what they were doing to get wise, but I'm not going to include that in my doctrine of marriage study. Okay? I'm going to exclude that. I'm going to exclude uh, other things. Okay? Uh, Leah and Rachel. <laughs> am I going to include that, the polygamy, the, 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 am I going to include that in my doctrine of marriage? Maybe. I mean, it just depends on how thorough I want this thing to be. But when I start excluding things, I have to know why I'm excluding them. And I've got to be fair with it. I'm going to exclude them because of their relevancy or lack of it. I'm going to exclude it because of its edification or lack of it. I'm going to exclude it. What I'm not going to do is exclude it because I don't like it. <laughs> okay? And, and so, 
uh, you know, I'm going to exclude all these volition passages because I'm a Calvinist and I've got to totally build my sovereignty side over here. Or I'm going to exclude all my sovereignty passages because I'm an Armenian and I, I really got to defend my Armenian case. Okay? Once you start doing that, you're, you're, you're out there. You're not being fair to the text. You're truly not employing an inductive approach to the scriptures. All right. There are rules of inductive logic. How many cases were examined? The larger number of samples, the, you know, the better, the stronger ground you're on. If you look at one or two verses and you're going to try to say, well, that's the description of all of Scripture, really? Find a few more. <laughs> Make sure you've got a real sample of all the Scriptures, not just a verse here and there. That's called cherry picking. How representative was the evidence? How carefully was the evidence examined? And how does the information gain correlate with other knowledge? What do you do at the end of the day when you've built this massive inductive study, you've come to your conclusion, and your conclusion is wrong. Obviously wrong. And you say, wait a minute. I know it can't be true because this is true. And you realize, hey, what? I got, there's more data I've got to go evaluate. There's more I've got to go study on. So there it is. And then probably at the end of the day, that's really the biggest difference from deductive to inductive is that with deductive, you've got a premise, you've got a premise, you've got a conclusion. That's the limited scope of what you're dealing with. But with inductive logic, can you go get more data? Can you go get more information? Is there more to add to this, to this understanding? Here's what I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, the, the kinds of probability and the degrees of probability. Absolute certainty, at least of a mathematical type, is only possible with deductive reasoning, not with inductive. Uh, however, if you do have a perfect induction, in other words, if you have absolute certainty that you have all the data conceivable, then, even if you don't reach an absolute certainty, mathematically speaking, you can provide a practical certainty. That's the term I misapplied earlier. I think I called it an effective certainty. A practical certainty, all right? Since every one of the cases was examined. But even there, even if you've reached a practical certainty because you've examined every case, what if something else was discovered? Okay. What if something else was discovered? In this, I've used as well in my apologetic ministry, and, or not ministry, but the effects that I've had occasionally here and there. People say, well, what if? What if this was found? What if archaeology discovered such and such? Wouldn't that just destroy your faith? <laughs> I think no. I'm not afraid of any manuscript that might appear. I'm not afraid of any discovery that might appear. Whatever it is, truth is truth. I'm not afraid of the truth. So whatever it is, we'll evaluate it. We'll add it to our inductive study. We'll we'll uh, place it in its context. We'll we'll understand it for what it is. But I'm not afraid of anything because God is true. Logic and God. If logic is the basis of all thinking, sounds like a premise, doesn't it? And theology is thinking about God, what's the conclusion? Then it follows that logic is the basis of all thinking about God. Kind of makes sense. Nevertheless, some object to this conclusion. They say God's an exception to the rule. Okay? He's outside of space, he's outside of time, he's outside of logic, right? Rules don't usually apply to God. He made the rules, so he's free to act miraculously and defy the rules. They're his rules anyway. So, it's interesting to consider, and somebody tell you that, but I don't think it holds up. Guys are going to think it holds up. Okay? What do you guys think? Okay? Is he outside the laws of thought? Well, not the way he describes himself in the Scriptures. The way he describes himself in the Scriptures is as a logical, rational being. That he's not the author of confusion. And so the way that he describes himself in the scriptures would be in conformity to the laws of logic. In fact, the idea of an illogical God or a translogical God is actually at odds with the definition of the supreme being. I think, fundamentally, something illogical is inferior to something that's logical. All right. And so he goes on. Um, and some of these are semantics in ways that I would agree or disagree with. I'd probably phrase them in different ways. Uh, but I'm running out of time. 
Oh, here's the critic. You know, Aristotle in the middle logic anyway. It's just, you know, the Greeks gave this to us. We can't trust that. Western civilization's decadence is the reason why everything's wrong in the world today. No, he didn't invent logic. He was the first to uh, write it down in such a systematic way, though, and we are indebted to his work, but... And I think everything since then has built on it or come from it. But he didn't invent it. And then he gives these examples of things that may seemingly be illogical or contradictory, predestination and free will, other things that are trinity. How can one be three? Isn't that illogical? Okay. All right. We have five minutes left. Any questions on chapter one or chapter five? Yes, sir. Can I have a microphone ready to go? Thank you, Chris. I don't know why I'm struggling. I didn't get my coffee. Here we go. I promised I would not walk off here. All right. I think most of us have uh, been familiar at some point with a fortiori logic, and it's obvious that that's not inductive, but I was a little surprised that he didn't include that in the deductive side of the discussion. Could you address that? Well, there's actually a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. That's one principle of, of, of many um, from the stronger. You know, it holds that if you can do the stronger, you can do the weaker. Uh, and, the, and there are... Yeah, there are, there are principles similar to that. It's not the only one. Um, I think they do show up in Come, Let Us Reason. They don't show up in, in this. This is just a short chapter designed to present the basics of the subject. Um, I'll hunt through Come, Let Us Reason after class and, and see if it's in there. Recommend that for me. Other questions? Do you see the value in approaching the Bible logically? I hope you do. I hope you do, because the mythology out there, and it comes back to meaning, it comes back to some things we read a week ago. The idea of faith is, is illogical to the unbelieving mind. They think that they have science and facts, and we have faith which is not grounded in reason or science or facts or anything. And it's just, they, they define faith, because <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand it. They define it as if it's just a wishful thinking, as if it's just imagination on our part, or pretending, or, or uh, embracing of a myth, and they call that a faith. No, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is trust in an object. And, and if you've evaluated that object for its trustworthiness, then you can place your faith in that object, and we do it all the time. You placed your faith in that chair before you put your weight on it and sat down on it. Okay? We put our faith on a lot of things. And uh, it is reasonable to trust what the Bible says. All right, meaning. Do words mean things? I believe they do. Okay. I think this is useful in the introduction. All true statements must be meaningful. Do you agree with that? If it's a nonsensical statement, then it's neither true nor false because it's nonsensical. That's the point he's making. And I, and I agree with that. Could you, could you go over what I mean to talk about language games? I'm just not really sure what that was. Yes, we can talk about language games. What exactly is that? That's the view in conventionalism that says um, any, any religious people play a, they have a, a language game that is unique to that sphere. Okay, So it's, it's certain language that you learn because this is the game you're playing. Yeah, there, there's terms that, that apply. If, if we're all playing Scrabble, then uh, we have terms like bingo. Okay, That within the scope of us playing Scrabble mean something. But they mean something else if we're playing a different game like bingo, okay? <laughs> right? Or bingo means something else in different contexts. So they, they basically say this view holds that religious language is part of a game and, and the terms are consistent within those that are playing that game, fellow adherents to a faith and so forth. But outside of that scope, they're meaningless. Okay? Shoot the moon. Uh, I'm playing hearts, okay? Yeah, I'm playing hearts if I'm shooting the moon. So that's what that's about. Or, careful. All right. My apologies, but uh, we are at the end of the hour. And we're going to reach the limits of our time. Um, we'll hang out a little bit here after class if you have additional questions. Uh, I will distribute the quiz. You can turn in your quiz. Quiz two, I'll distribute quiz three. And uh, for next week, you want to read uh, chapters 7 and 8. Page numbers or whatever they are, depending on the book you've got. But chapters 7 and 8. All right? Thank you, Father, for truth. That word is truth. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for logic. Thank you, Father, that you do make sense. And I thank you in Christ Jesus' name.